The Edo state government has restated the need for individuals who recently came into the country, traveled from high incident states or had contacts with confirmed cases to report themselves to the COVID-19 toll-free response lines. This followed the rise in the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus in the state to 108. The State Commissioner for Health, Dr. Patrick Okundia, who made the appeal in Benin City, noted that compliance with social distancing, self-isolation, self-reporting and other guidelines against the spread of the virus would complement the state government's effort in containing it. Okundia said Edo State has so far recorded 108 confirmed cases, 1,058 suspected cases, 5 deaths and 35 recoveries. Noting that improved efforts at testing were responsible for the rising number of confirmed cases. Joining us now via tele telephone is Dr. Emmanuel Uduari, Chief Resident, Department of Family Medicine, UBTH. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. What is the level of compliance when it comes to um, orders on staying safe and preventing the spread of the virus in the state? So there is a broader context um, about um, compliance with the state directives. Now, the state directives are actually sequel to the NCDC directives. Um, it comprises of uh, wearing a face mask, physical distancing measures by maintaining six streets about two meters apart, and um, it also includes routine hand washing, there's hand hygiene. Now, amongst others, uh, in past status, there is the enforcement of those rules before you come into most institutions in the state, like banking halls and all that. You have to don a face mask. The same applies to civil service past status. Now, the challenge is on the street, where there is no enforcement. You find that the vast majority of persons are without face masks. Now, that's a challenge because it means that on the part of we healthcare workers and um, advocacy on different media platforms, we have not been able to communicate the urgency and exigency of individual participation in containment measures. So what we are saying is only when the whip is applied, like at the portal of entry into parasitas or institutions, that's when people comply. So they comply not because they believe that their participation is actually preventing the spread of the scourge. They participate because that's the only way they can access certain services. So that's not good enough. So on that part, compliance with the, by the public is really, really poor. Okay, as one of the lead members of the COVID-19 response team um, in yes. the state, um, yes. what is the reality on the ground that is not, I mean, in the public domain right now? All right. Um, you have hospital-based studies. You have um, uh, hospital um, information that are, that's accessible and available to those who are healthcare workers. But on the streets, what people do tend to know is what has been put across in the media. Uh, so unless they have a personal experience, there's always a challenge that that information may get muddied up with conspiracy theories and other um, half-truths. So we do know in the hospital, as far as I'm in the premier teaching hospital in the South-South, the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. So we do know that um, we have a scourge in town. It is clear that the severity is more amongst those who are immunocompromised, immunosuppressed. Uh, of the five deaths you mentioned that are occurred in the Edo State, four have occurred in our facility amongst those who were severely ill. Now, but the truth is that those in town, because for this coach, the majority of persons will be asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, they may not even know that they are positive and their careers. The problem is that they could pass it on to a vulnerable person who is diabetic who is on immunosuppressive drugs, who has other conditions, what we call comorbidities, that have affected their immune system. That's the challenge. For the I, I, most I wanna... part, people who have it, we have no issues. Some will not even know that they're positive, but they could become unwitting careers and pass it on to those 
who are vulnerable. That's I want to make reference to something you said earlier about people yeah. complying to instructions, not because yeah. they believe the virus exists, but because that's how they can access uh, certain um, utilities. Um, yeah, absolutely. What, what, what more do you think can be done when it comes to the area of enlightenment, especially in the rural areas, for these people to actually understand that they have a responsibility, aside just complying with others, but to protect themselves? That's a very vital point because um, this the rural urban drift, we have a demographic dichotomy. Most persons who reside in the urban area belong to the young working age population. Those who are more likely to get it, but less likely to fall sick. Now in the rural area, the preponderance is with the geriatric population, that's the elderly population, who because they are not as mobile, are less likely to get it, but if they do get it, are more likely to fall sick and even die. Now, so the message has to be contextualized. We have to use colloquial communication media to ensure that there's a native dialect that those in the rural areas get the message. Interestingly, it's, we find out that it's easier for even the elderly to believe our message than the young who are exposed to social media and conspiracy theories, and um, are also having the background treasure of the economic effect of lockdown measures that is now beginning to block and conflate with the message we're passing across. So we, they are not seeing the contagion as a threat, an essential threat to their economic way of being. So they are more likely to discountenance facts and figures that concern the contagion and more likely to be vulnerable to conspiracy theories because their real problem is that their pockets and their stomachs are being affected. So Fair we enough. have to pass the message in a more ingenuous way to the different demographics. Indeed, that will be helpful. But before I let you go, I want to uh, pick your brains on the issue of, um, you know, preparing for the worst as um, advocated by the Minister of Health. Even the World yes. Health Organization says that um, this is not, we've not seen the end of COVID-19. Oh, okay. um, yeah. This kind of messaging, um, what's your thinking about it? Is it appropriate at this time or um, it is like reverse the way of trying to get people to do things by inspiring them, um, making them scared, so to speak. So um, when you're approaching a situation, you have three or a trimodal um, approach. You either have the benefit of hindsight, the benefit of insight, and then the benefit of foresight. Now for this situation, because we have the benefit of hindsight vis-a-vis -vis previous pandemics, we can now begin to evaluate evolving data and then project and prognosticate into the future. Now, just some years back, um, some five decades back, uh, sorry, some eight decades, nine decades back, during the Spanish flu pandemic, it was during the reopening and the second peak that most of the 50 million people who died, that's when they died. So, it's against that background that the WHO and the Honorable Minister of Health are beginning to say that we need to plan for the best, but prepare for the worst. Those containment measures of identify, isolate, contact trace, and treat that form the epidemiological premise of containment need to be ramped up now more than ever before. Now you recall, just yesterday, the WHO said they had 107,000 new cases of the coronavirus, that's the highest ever since the outbreak began in Wuhan. Now, this is expected, but it means that the healthcare facilities globally, especially in Africa, where healthcare systems are critically weak, now to start breaking up hope that we start having a flaw, the deluge of All right, persons who are critically ill. Um, I, I have to interject. I know there's so much more yes. to talk about, but that's all time will permit us now. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your time, your very precious time with us. Thank you for having me.